main things that we talked about were how to, you know, sort of the mechanics of let's say you have a Java program already, like the Hello World program, how you can compile it, run it, and so on. So we talked about sort of the pieces involved in having a Java program and running it without looking at the details of the program. So we kind of looked on a higher level. Today we're going to look at the details of the program and then get more involved. So the first thing we said is that to compile Java, so to program and compile Java, you need the JDK. To run Java, Java, you merely need the JRE, Java Runtime Environment. So if you download the Java Standard Edition, you'll get both of these. Some of you may already have this on your machine, if you have ever used a Java program before, but you need both of them in order for you to write and compile your own program. All right. Every Java program consists of at least one class. All our code is going to live in classes, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about what a class is. For now, you minimally need one class that's sort of the boss of the application, sort of is the class that actually gets the ball rolling. And that class may use other classes, but you definitely need one class to get the ball rolling. And classes by convention are capitalized. So in the case of our Hello World, our class name was Hello World. So by convention, every word in the class name is capitalized, including the first. All right? The code for that class is going to be in a file that matches the name exactly and has the word Java after it. So this is the source code. This is a code written in Java that you, or in this case, someone else wrote uh, that does the job that it needs to do. The machine, your computer can't execute Java source code directly. Therefore, there's a process known as compiling. And compiling produces a class file. So in our case, compiling would create hello world dot class. This is not human readable, the got class. If you look at it, you might be able to pick out a few things here and there. But for the most part, it's not human readable. It's what is called byte code. And it is not machine specific. So theoretically, you should be able to write a Java program on a Windows machine and run it in a Mac. That's not always the case for programming environments, because sometimes things get compiled right directly into what's called machine code and not byte code. Machine code is the code that's native to a particular processor. But in this case, it gets compiled to a byte code. That byte code is input to the JRE, which we talked about up here, and that actually runs the program. So what you need to do is you need to do a couple things. To get, in, to get Java working on your machine. You need to compile, uh, I'm sorry, you need to download the standard edition that includes the JDK for your particular hardware, so Mac or Linux or Windows or whatever, hardware slash operating system, I should say. You need to download that code uh, and install it. And on most platforms, you need to set a path system variable so it knows where you've installed Java so that when you go to the command line and, and compile uh, or try to run a Java program, it knows how to handle it. Compiling is done with the Java C command. Running is done 
with simply Java. And you just would put the class name of sort of the boss class. Here you would put the whole source file name in there. So that in five minutes or so was what we, was, was the main things that I wanted to get over to you uh, in class last time. So I hope you can go and do that. Or maybe you've already done it. If you haven't already done that on your own machine, or the machine and lab, you know, try that today. Just take the examples that, that were created and uh, the Hello World example or the second Hello World example and download it, make sure Java is installed, compile it, and see what you get. As I mentioned before, the most common problem is that the, the, the path doesn't get set correctly. All right? So you need to set the path to find Java find the Java executables, both Java C and uh, Java.exe. Uh, Typically, on a Windows machine, they will be in here. I hope I do this right. On your C drive, program files, Java, the version of Java that you're running, notice here JDK and JRE. And in my case, they are in, whoops, program files, Java, JDK, blah, 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 bin. If you're setting your path, if you click over there, you can go and copy and paste that into where you set your environment variables. Okay. So let's go, uh, that, that's again in a nutshell what we did and what I expected you to get out of last time. All right. What we're going to do today is we're going to actually look at some Java code and sort of get an idea of at the very basic uh, level what's in Java code. Um, so we're going to start that by looking at the Hello World app which we looked at um, last time. And I'll create this again by copying this and going into Notepad++ There are IDEs for Java, but generally, uh, in this class, at least to start out, we're going to use plain, plain old text editors. Um, I find that, like for example, in the C Sharp classes, uh, people tend to um, rely on the IDE of Visual Studio, and um, it, 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 it's great, but I think it's best to understand the language well before you get into the IDE. The analogy I would give, and I give this in all my classes, is like someone that's learning addition. You know, if you're going to learn addition, it's better to learn it how to do it yourself, and then you can use a calculator. Like later on, I wouldn't expect, you know, um, you know, someone to struggle and do every addition problem manually for the rest of their life. But you should know how to do one. Right? So you should know how to write Java code without the benefit of an IDE and to be sure that when you use an IDE your life will be easier. So I went and I copied that code and I pasted it in uh, a file. I'm going to save that file on the desktop. And the name should match the name of the class. The class is Hello World with a capital H and a capital W. So I'm going to call this Hello World Java, exactly as it is written there. And I'm going to save it. I'm actually going to move it into a folder on its own. It's nice to have all your classes in a folder because then you can just zip up the whole folder and send it to me. Yes? So does it just break if you misname the file for whatever reason? 
Yeah, yeah it'll give you like an error message, uh, a w at least a warning, uh, but likely an error message that says it should be in, in that. Okay. So Java has some conventions for naming things <laughs> that we'll look at as the course progresses. And one of the conventions is the, the source should be in a file called whatever the class name is, .java. So here we go. All right. So now I want to compile it. And we're going to do everything on the command line, which, again, is, you know, old school, right? Not as old school as back when I was in college and I used punch cards, but it's a good approximation of that. So I'm going to get to the command line. Actually, in Windows, it's now known as the PowerShell. You don't have to run PowerShell as admin in Windows? No. I'll make it a little bit bigger. All right, I'm in the user directory. Uh, my file is off the desktop, and the desktop is a folder underneath the user directory, so I'm going to go CD desktop. Slash. I don't remember what I called it. So I'll do CD desktop. That will take me to the desktop directory. Then I think I did Java. And there we go. DIR will show us the contents of the directory. So the contents of this directory is one, hello world, Java. I can periodically clear the screen by typing in CLS, clear screen. In a nut, yeah, I'm saying in a nutshell a lot today, uh, but, but Generally speaking, the only command line stuff that you really need to know um, is how to navigate around directories, all right? Um, and uh, do a directory listing, do a clear screen, and then the commands to compile and run the Java program. So if you can do that, if you can do a CD command, uh, what if you want to change drives? Like if you want to go to your thumb drive, You'd have to know what that thumb drive was. Like in this case, I don't think I have a, a thumb drive uh, in, but there might be a network drive. Yeah, we'll go to Z. I would type in, to go to a different drive, like a thumb drive, you'd type in the letter of the drive, and then you could CD to where you wanted to go. All right. so. That way, if you wanted to keep all your stuff on your thumb drive and just compile it and work on it on the machines here and then take it home and compile it, um, that's what you do. OK. We have not compiled it yet, so all we have is this Java file. To compile it again, type in Java C and the name of the file. Hello world.java. Uh, as far as compiling goes, no news is good news. If it simply shows you the command prompt again, then it compiled cleanly. Um, Java was written at its basic by sort of like old school programmers, so you're not going to get a lot of bells and whistles when you compile it uh, on the command line. You're not going to get a message saying congratulations, your, your program compiled and, and all that. To run it then, you type in Java and the name of the class file and you're in business. Hello world. All right, so let's look at sort of the guts of this program. Remember, the class file itself, the dot class file, is not machine readable. It is what's produced. It is what is called byte code, and that's the code that the Java virtual machine executes. So when we type in Java, hello world, it is looking for that class file, and the Java virtual machine is loading that class file and running it. I could take this and put this on my Mac and the class file and run it, and it would work okay. All right? Let's look at the Java source. And I think we started to last time, but we didn't get very far. All right? This is a bunch of comments. There's essentially two ways that you can designate a comment. If you want to comment an individual line, 
You do it by putting a slash slash in the first couple of characters. Very common. C Sharp, I'm sure, does the same thing. If you want to comment multiple lines, you can do like this person did. Do a slash star at the beginning and do a star slash at the end. So if you do that, everything between the slash star and the star slash is considered a comment. When I say it's a comment, you all understand what that means, right? What does it mean? Yes? Right. It's meant for you or someone else that's making changes to the code or that's looking at the code. The compiler ignores comments. So it's not like it has any bearing on how the program executes. It's just explanation. Remember, one of your goals as, as a software developer, whether you're doing web development or software development or whatever, is to make your code easy to maintain. I'll tell you what. If I ever ask you why we do something, why do we split things into different classes? Why do we put comments in our code? Why do we follow conventions when we name our stuff? If you don't know the answer, just shout out maintainability. All right? Because that's the reason we do most of our things that count as good programming practices. Right? Because a substantial portion of the time and money that goes into a program isn't necessarily with the original creation of the program, it's with making changes to the program later on. All right? So what we want to do is we want to give ourselves a little bit of an advantage in making it easier for us to change it. And one of the ways we can do that is by putting comments in our code. Uh, this is a really short program. But when you get into larger programs with multiple classes that do a bunch of things, that do a bunch of complicated things, having comments really helps you. Because if you worked out a program today, you might not have to make a change for it for a few months. And believe me, in that gap of time, you're going to forget exactly how it worked. All right? You might remember certain parts of it, but certain parts are going to be fuzzy. So it's nice to have an English language comment that describes what you're doing. All right? And it should be very functional. It shouldn't explain how the statement works. It should explain why you wrote that statement there. What is the meaning of it? All right, so two ways that you can have comments. Different organizations sometimes have other rules for making comments, like put who created it, put uh, a change log that says that it was edited on this day and this was added to it or whatever. All right, every one of these .java files contains a class. And for the most part, it's going to be a one-to-one -one relationship between .java files and classes. So one .java file is going to contain one class, and each class is going to have its own .java file. So one-to-one -one correspondence between it, in general. I said this in my class earlier today. When I make these, these generalization statements like, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence or whatever, kind of read in your head like, well, there might be some exceptions, but we're talking for now about like most of the time how it works. All right, so for the most part, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Yes, there are exceptions. There's exceptions to like just about everything in the world, right? But for the most part, there's going to be one class in this file, and every file has a dot, or every class has a dot Java. We start out by saying public, class, and the name of the class. All right. Um, for now, most of the classes we create are going to be public classes. A public class is a class that other people, other classes, I don't want to say other people because it's not people, it's programs, that other classes can use and can be seen by the runtime environment, can be seen by other classes. Right now, all the classes that we're going to make are going to be public. All right? Maybe later on, we'll have a class that won't be public. But for the most part, all the classes that we create in the beginning of the class are going to be public. So public class means 
the outside world can see it. All right? If I made this private, I could compile it, but it wouldn't do me any good because I can run it. I couldn't run it because the JRE wouldn't be able to see it. Next thing is the word class. Okay? That designates that this is a class. Right now, in the beginning of this course, we're going to be creating pretty much exclusively classes. There are other things that a chunk of code can be. There's something called an interface, which is like a class, but different. All right? But for now, we're not creating any interfaces. We'll do that later on in the semester. So for now, public class is going to be at the beginning of like all of our code, all of our code files. And then we have the name of the class, which should follow the convention that the first letter is capitalized, and the first letter of every word is capitalized. OK? We then have braces that go around the body of the class. <coughs> Excuse me. One nice thing about a little bit better text editor than just plain old notepad is if you notice when I put my cursor next to the brace, it shows me the matching brace down here. So it shows me that these two go together. There really shouldn't be anything after that last brace because everything in this class appears between here and here. All right? Here's between here and here. So, public class, the name of our class, a brace, a bunch of stuff, and then another brace. What's the stuff that appears between the braces? There's two kinds of things that appear between the braces. This example only has one of them. All right? We can have attributes, and we can have methods or functions. Methods or functions roughly mean the same thing. This one doesn't have any attributes. It only has methods. All right? And this has exactly one method. Public indicates that other classes and the Java virtual machine can use this function, can call this function. All right? We won't necessarily make all of our functions public, but we'll make probably most of our functions public. All right? Static is a special kind of function that we're not going to talk about right now. Just know that this particular function, the main function, needs the word static after public. All right, and we'll talk about the meaning of static later on. Void is the return value of this function. There's sort of three things associated with a function that you need to know. You need to know the name of the function. You need to know what arguments you supply the function, and finally you need to know what the function is going to return. Void simply means that this function does not return a value. All right? So that's what void means when you see a function. Other functions do return a value, and we specify the kind of data that it returns. For example, if we had a function to calculate someone's pay, all right, it might return a double. All right? If we had a function that calculated how many years old someone ha is, it might return an integer. All right? So think of the return value as the type of data that the function is going to return. I might have a function that says, give me this person's email address. And that would return a string, because email addresses contain strings. So this particular function doesn't return anything. And therefore, we put void there. 
main is the name of the function in this case. And these are the arguments. We can actually give this function a set of string arguments. All right? And we might play around with that in a minute. This is a way for us to pass data into this function from the command line. All right? <coughs> So this is the function definition, sometimes called the function signature. All right? What does it contain? It contains whether it's public or private. It contains if it's static. It contains what the return value is. It contains the name of the function. And then it contains any arguments you can pass the function. All right? If I had a function to calculate tuition at LC. It might be something like public double, because it returns a double value, or it returns a number. Calculate tuition, and the arguments might be the type of residency the student has, whether they're in county or not, and the number of credit hours they're taking. So that's what I mean by the signature of the function. Now, I mentioned before that every Java application has to have at least one class. And one, that class is sort of the boss class. It's the class that sort of gets everything rolling. All right? Whatever that boss class is, it needs the main function in it. So every Java application is going to have at least one class that has a public static, void, main function in it. If you didn't have this function in it, you wouldn't be able to run any of the code. So every Java application will have at least one class that contains a public, static, void, main method. All right? Now, thing to remember is Java is case sensitive. So if I do something like this, public class and try to compile it. It gives me a few errors. All right? Actually, it gives me three errors. One wrong letter gives me three errors. That's both the discouraging but also the encouraging word. You know, because if you make one error, you may see a whole bunch of errors. All right? It doesn't mean that you made a whole bunch of mistakes. Maybe you made one mistake that triggered three different errors. Reading errors is uh, sort of a, a skill, like anything else. So at first, I would think that you might need help, like understanding what the error messages are. My hope is as the, as the semester progresses, there's certain errors that you'll see over and over again, and you'll sort of get an idea how the Java compiler words these errors. So let's look at this. It does give us some help. It says it's expecting class, interface, or enum, or enumerator. What does it have instead? And it uses a caret to point to that. Well, it has a class, but with a capital C. So it tells us that this is where it went wrong. This is where it started to go wrong. Now these other errors, all right, are just sort of side effects of that first error. Because if hello world is a class, I'm, I'm sorry, if hello world is not a class, class spelled with lower C, then we can't define a function. And if we if hello world is not a class, then this last brace doesn't make any sense because there's supposed to be a class in this file. So the fix would be to simply set it back to where it's correct. And we do that, and we then can compile. By the way, one thing that's useful is you can use the arrow keys to scroll through your most recent commands when you're in a command line. So for example, I compiled it. I got this error. If I use the up arrow one time, it shows me the last command I tried. 
So you can try compiling it again, and there you go. If I hit the up arrow twice, or three times actually, it will take me back to the third to last command that I tried, which was to run the code. So that works. Okay. So, every Java application has at least one boss class, get the ball rolling class. Another way to say it is a class that contains a function that looks like this. Because when I run, when I type in Java Hello World, this is the function it executes. This class could have 20 other functions in it. But this is the function that executes first, no matter what. All right? So, this class consists of only one statement and one comment. Here we have a comment that explains what it does, that it prints out hello world to the terminal window. Okay, pretty good comment. And then we have system.out.println, and then in parentheses we have hello world and closed in quotes. All right? And then we have a semicolon. Every statement in Java ends with a semicolon. This is a little confusing. This is built into the Java language that the Java system or the Java virtual machine has associated with it a default output. And typically that default output is going to be the screen. So we're saying send, run this function on the default, ob, the default output object of the Java system. Right now it might be confusing the fact that system is capitalized, out is not capitalized, and print ln is not capitalized. I'm going to try to explain that now. And if you get it, great. If you don't get it, don't sweat about it right now. It'll come later on when we talk a little bit more about classes and objects and functions and all those cool things. All right? I can tell println is a function. Even if I never saw this statement before, if I knew the basics of Java programming, I can tell it's a function because it accepts arguments, right? After the, after the name, I see parentheses and I see a value. Functions, by convention, start with a lowercase letter, right? Functions are methods. Main is a function, so it starts with a lowercase m. Print ln is a, lowercase, is a function, therefore it starts with a lowercase p, all right? Typically, those functions use what's called camel case, you know, kind of has like the humps of a camel where the first letter is lowercase uh, of the first word. Each subsequent word is capitalized. So if this was called main function, it would be like this. All right? But it's not main function, it's main, because it has to be main. If I called it main function, then I wouldn't be able to run this program because every Java app has to have at least one class that contains a main function. So it's no different from C sharp in terms of how the, how the Yeah, the conventions of C sharp. Remember, C sharp was sort of uh, a is a knockoff of Java, right? So a lot of what you're going to see, you know, the, the semicolon at the end of the line is going to be different. Uh, but an if statement is going to look the same, an assignment statement is going to look the same. What's really going to be different is the objects that you have, because there's no such object in C Sharp or the .NET framework like system out print ln. Like exactly. Yeah, they have they have different objects as part of the framework. Out. I might not know what it is. All right, uh, at first glance, but it's not a function because there's no parentheses after it. It's also not a class because it's not capitalized. Out is actually an object, and we'll define what an object is uh, 
uh, probably later on, um, probably, probably on Monday. All right? System is capitalized, so that's our hint that system is a class. So, if I was going to explain how this works, I would say the system class has a component called out. That component has a function called println that accepts an argument, and that argument is what we want to print out. Now, notice that this is enclosed in quotes. That means it's what is called a literal. Uh, what a literal means is that we literally want the values between the quotes, all right, the characters between the quotes. That's different than a variable. So like if I said, if I forgot the quotes, let's say, let's see how many errors we get for this. We actually get two errors. It thinks hello is a variable and it thinks world is a variable because they're not enclosed in quotes. All right? You don't get that error if you put them in quotes because it recognizes, hey, this, we're not referring to variables here. We're referring to the actual value of that string. Let's make a couple other errors. Let's forget the capitalized system. It doesn't know what system is because system's a class and classes start with a capital S. It'll give us sort of the same sort of error but with a little bit different meaning if we did capitalize out, because out is an object, not a class. So it'll give us some sort of error message. It says that it doesn't know something called out that's part of system. It doesn't know out with a capital O. And finally, if we gave something like that, it doesn't know of a method called printl because the name of the method is println. It takes a little while to be get uh, to be get to be getting used to the the verbiage that the uh, errors give us, all right? Uh, but again, you know, that, you'll, you'll gain that skill over time. In the meantime, ask me if you're running any questions. So let's sort of finish this one off and look at the second version of the Hello World, one that contains a little bit more stuff in it, all right? Just a teensy bit more. All right, comments are pretty straightforward. We won't talk about them. The file name is the name of the class.java. Okay, that's fine. Public class, the name of the class. That means that the outside world can refer to this class. And everything in the class is between here and here. What can be between classes? Well, there's going to be some mix of attributes and methods. We have, uh, in this particular example, we have a single method. That has its own set of braces that indicates everything that belongs in that method. For our Java app to work, we need at least one class that has a public static void main string arguments. Okay, we have to have at least one class that has that. And that's the class that gets run, I'm sorry, that's the method that gets run when we type in Java Hello world. Let me All 
All right. So that's the function that gets called. If we had another function here that outputted good night moon or whatever, it wouldn't get called unless we explicitly call that. But the main gets called whenever we call, whenever we run that class with the Java command. This is how we output stuff. Capital system dot out dot print ln, and then in closing parentheses we have the uh, message. I mentioned that we we're going to talk about arguments. We might say that for next time. All right. When we run this like that, there's no arguments after it, and therefore, really nothing happens. It's not affected. All right. Let's look at the second example. The second hello world example. Because you sort of need this one, or you need some of the things uh, about this one to do your homework assignment. Oh. And. I'm going to create a second folder. And I'll call it Java 2. And I'll move. This guy in here. Now, I'm going to go and compile it. So I need to get into that folder. That folder is also on the desktop. So I can type in cd dot dot. That takes me up a directory. And then I can do slash java2. So that will take me up to the desktop directory. And then I can go down to java2. Do a dir listing. And I'm going to do Java C, hello world one dot Java. And right off the bat, it gives me an error. It says, hello world is a public class, should be declared in a file named hello world dot Java. So right off the bat, this file's named wrong. Because if we look at this, The class is called hello world, but the file is called hello world one. So in order for this to work, we want to go and we want to rename that file to hello world. You don't have to dimension the array when you declare it? No. Oh. Sorry, I had to off the A little bit, yeah, but that, that's okay. All right, so now I can edit it. And I should be able to compile it now because if I do a dir, it's called hello world and the class name is hello world. I'm cutting off a little bit at the bottom. files cleanly and then I can run it and it says hello Jerry all right so it's a little bit different let's look at how it's different it's different because this has a little bit of randomization in it this chooses between one of four names and outputs whatever randomly chosen name that it picks. All right. Let's look at these statements one at a time and figure out how this works. Because if I run this over and over again, even without compiling it, it's not going to say the same thing every time. All right. It randomly picks it. 
So let's look at these statements. One thing that's good to do, by the way, uh, a good exercise is to comment the code examples that I do in class. All right. So a good, a good way to help you understand this is to go back and comment the code to put explanation in. All right. So everything about this is the same up until the, the details of that main. It's a public class hello world. It has a public static void main. And it has something in the main function. This is declaring an array. This is how you can declare an array in Java. String means it's a string variable. That's the type of each element in the array. The two brackets mean that it's an array of strings. What's the difference between an array and a regular value? Regular variable. Well, an array can store uh, multiple variables. Exactly. An array can store multiple values. So in this case, we're storing multiple strings. If we have an array that's hard-coded, we can define the array like this. Within the curly braces, we can put our three or four or five strings in here. All right? In this case, there's four strings, Mike, Joe, Jerry, and Joyce. All right? So it will create an array with four elements in it. Those elements, how are they numbered? 0, 1, 2, and 3. So however many elements you have, the valid subscript to those elements is 0, 1, 2, and 3. So Mike is array element 0. Joe is array element 1, 2, and 3. So when we say names, we have to specify the name, which name we want. Do we want name 0, name 1, name 2, name 3? All right. So, this is what we have so far. We have an array with four elements in it. Name zero is Mike, name one is Joe, and so on. This statement says, I want to create an integer named random. All right? An integer is what? A whole number, so no fractions. Notice that string is an uppercase int is a lowercase. That's significant. All right? Strings are actually, the string data type is actually a class. The int is what is called a primitive. All right? We'll cover that more next week, but a string is actually another kind of class. An int is actually a primitive. Primitives are like just basic, simple data that all they have is a value. All right, all that you have for an integer is a value, right? All you have for a Boolean is a value, and so on. So we have an integer that's named random. And that equals to this function, math.random, you don't really need the space there, times 4, and then int. Let's look at this statement a piece at a time. Math random is a built-in function in Java. Math is a class. Random is a function on that class. This function gives us a value between 0 and 0.99999. So math.random. The lowest number is going to give us a 0. The highest number is going to give us is 0.9999 repeating forever. We take that and multiply it by 4. All right? So we multiply 0 by 4. That's equal to what? 0. We multiply 0.9999 by 4. What do we get? Well, we effectively get 3.9999.
Somewhere in the middle here, we have 1 1.1, 1 1.8, 2.4, 2.6. We have a whole bunch of numbers from 0 to 3.99, all right, depending on the random number that was generated. So, this expression here gives us a number randomly distributed between 0 and 3.99999. Then we do this, which is called casting the result. Casting is essentially setting it to a certain type. So we make that number an integer. So what is our range of values now? 0, 1, 2, and 3. All right. So we're going to get 0, 1, 2, or 3. And that value is going to be stored in the variable random. We then have our old statement system out print ln, and we output hello, and we add. When you have strings, the way you add is concatenating them, putting them together. The value from the name array that's indexed by the random variable. So either it's going to say hello name 0, which would be hello Mike. Hello, name one, which would be Joe, and so on down the line. What you need to do for your assignment is to, to create a, a Mad Lib. A Mad Lib is like a little poem or, or quote or whatever, where you substitute three different randomly chosen values. This one does one. You need to essentially do this, but do three different values. All right? So that's what you need to do for your first assignment. I would think that. If you take this example and extend it, you'll be able to uh, do it. Um, I do expect you to dot the I's and cross the T. It makes me sad if I like open your assignment and your class is called Hello World. All right? It's not a Hello World. It's, mad, it's a Mad Lib. So call it Mad Lib. Call your class that. Or call it something that's relevant to what it means. Don't, you know, if you're going to take and adapt one of my examples, at least change the variable names, the class names, et cetera, to make it relevant to your thing. All right. I always give more than you paid for. I went five minutes over time today. So we'll see you up in lab. Uh, and uh, those of you that aren't coming to lab, we'll see you next week. Quick question. Huh? Yes.